Good morning. Welcome to our service on this the 21st of August. You're especially welcome if you're visiting us today. Fiona Gray is back taking our service today, so welcome back, Fiona. The auction for church funds will be on Friday the 2nd of September at 7 p.m. with viewing from 5 p.m. The hall will be open Monday to Thursday from 6 to around 7.30 to receive items for sale. So start looking around your house to see what you, you can usefully pass on to the auction for sale. Um, if you can help with in any way with the auction, please speak to Kay or contact Hilary in the office. Uh, on Tuesday 6th of September, our Bible studies read by, led by Reverend David Bryce begin again, probably in the upper room at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. They're very informal and informative, so please think about coming along and giving it a try. You're all very welcome to go through to the lower hall at the end of the service to have tea or coffee together. Next Sunday, 28th of August, the service will be led by Reverend Gabriel Farker. These are all the announcements. Please stand to receive the word of God. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to be able to be back with you to worship together today. Our call to worship is from Psalm 63, verses 1 to 4. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. <clears throat> my soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land in which there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. Let's sing together, holy. Holy, holy.
Our opening prayer is based on the words of Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 18. Let's pray. All praise and glory be yours, O God, for the richness of your grace, for the splendor of your gifts, for the wonder of your love. We praise you for creating this world in all its beauty, for redeeming the world through Christ our Lord, and for sending us the gift of your Spirit to encourage, instruct, and sustain us. We long for your Spirit to work among us now, to inspire our praise, to challenge us with your truth, and to equip us for service in your world. Eternal God, you are the power behind all things, behind the energy of the storm, behind the heat of a million suns. Eternal God, you are the power behind all minds, behind the ability to think and reason, behind all understanding of the truth. Eternal God, you are the power behind the cross of Christ, behind the weakness, the torture and the death, behind unconquerable love. Eternal God, we worship and adore you. God of light and truth, you are beyond our grasp or conceiving. Before the brightness of your presence, the angels veil their faces. With lowly reverence and adoring love, we acclaim your glory and sing your praise, for you have shown us your truth and love in Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Mighty God, we do not yet see the glory you plan for all humankind, but in faith we do see Jesus. We thank you for the humility and holiness in which he lived and died. We praise you that he freed us from our sin, that he comforts and strengthens us through our struggles, and that he gives us courage to follow him. For this, we now join with all creation and shout for joy, Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. We give thanks to you, God our Father, for mercy that reaches out, for patience that waits our returning, for your love that is ever ready to welcome sinners. We praise you that in Jesus Christ you came to us with forgiveness and that by your Holy Spirit you move us to repent and receive your love. Though we are sinners, you are faithful and worthy of all praise. We praise you, great God, in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Janet's going to come up and do our first reading for us this morning. Um, this morning's reading is taken from Matthew chapter 6, and beginning at verse 6, and you can find it on page 970 in the Bibles in the pews. Hear the word of God. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Here ends the reading. Thank you. Do I have any young people this morning? Just the wee tote. 
Okay, you're all children for today. You're all elected. So you're going to have to get your thinking hats on. How do we get things in life? If you have needs or wants, what do you do? What did you do when you were kids? Maybe you young ones are still doing it. When you want something new, what do you do? Go to mommy and daddy, the bank of mother and father. And how do we pay for the things? Sometimes cash, sometimes a card, the being of our existence these days with the uh, rates going through the roof. What about God? How do we get things from God? Do we have to give him money? Or do we have to behave in a certain way? Do we have to be really good for a month or two and come to church every week and, you know, do all the nice, good things? And then maybe God will reward us. It doesn't work like that. God knows what we need before we ever say anything to him. And he wants to give us what we want, what we need. He loves us and he wants to hear from us. He wants us to come to him and ask. And he promises that he will give it to us. There's nothing that we can do to earn or deserve anything from God. But he promises to grant us what we need for life. As parents, we know and anticipate our children's needs. But we still like it when they come and ask politely, Can I please have? And God knows what we need too. But he wants us to talk to him through prayer. Not just to ask for things, but to talk to him, to confess our sins. Tell him what we need. Tell him how we're feeling. And to praise him and thank him for all he's done. God gives us what we need each day. This doesn't always mean that we get what we want. God has three answers. Sometimes he says, yes, I'll give you that. Sometimes he says, no, because what we're asking for is not a good thing for us to have, even though we might think it would be wonderful. But very often God's answer is, not yet. We just have to be patient and wait. And that's the biggest struggle for me. I am not patient when it comes to things like that. But the, the important thing is that God has already given us the most essential thing for our lives. He gave us Jesus to die on the cross that we might be saved. But God also lets us have food and shelter and family and friends and other things that he knows we benefit from. He invites us to come to him in prayer and he promises to be with us when we do. God values and loves us and wants to give us good things. We might worry about the future, but we can rest assured that he is in control. Doesn't take cards or cash or anything like that. He's just asking us for simple prayer. The prayer that Jesus taught us in the Bible is a kind of a template for us to follow. God in heaven, your name is holy. I hope that your kingdom would reign on earth just like it is in heaven. Give us what we need each day, but forgive us and help us to forgive others. Don't let us give in to sin, but take us away from evil, because everything belongs to you, now and forever. We can go to God any time and ask for what we think we need. 
He might not answer the way we want, but he always listens. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for letting us come to you in prayer. And thank you for providing all that we need. Help us to trust in you no matter what, and to truly love you and one another. Thank you for your love. Amen. We're going to sing Thank You, Jesus. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, you chose us and have loved us from before the world began. Out of that love, you anticipate and provide for all our needs before we even ask. You have given us so much, and out of that bounty, we give back to you our gifts, tithes, and offerings. Use them and us so that others may come to know of your great generosity and endless love. Amen. I'm going to read from Philippians chapter 3, verses 5 to 14. It's on page 1180 in the Bibles. Philippians chapter 3, 5 to 14. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God 
and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. Amen. The ministry of prayer is part of the baptismal calling of every believer. We pray for the world because God so loves it. We pray for the church because it is Christ's body living and working in the world. So let's pray together now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, in Christ you taught us to pray and promised that we would receive all that we ask in his name. Hear now our prayers. For the church universal, that she will have the courage to carry out your commission to spread the gospel to every person. For this congregation, its mission and ministry, for the work among the young people and the God-given vision for the future of the church family here in Joy Mount. For the healing of the earth from all the damage man has done to destroy the beauty of your creation. For peace and justice in the world and the ceasing of all conflicts for nations and leaders, that fairness and wisdom will prevail. For our local community, as we all face growing bills for food, fuel and energy, help us to remember that we are more important than many sparrows. For the poor and oppressed, bring freedom from fear. For the bereaved and lonely, bring friendship and joy. For all who need healing and those who have been healed, we praise you, Lord. Guide us, O God, by your Holy Spirit, that all of our prayers and all of our lives may serve your will and show your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing again. This time it's Hear the Call of the Kingdom. <coughs>
are the most important things in the life of the church? There are lots of clubs and societies where people come together to share a common interest. Think of the supporters clubs for football teams, or a golf club, or a boat club. We have all of these in Carrick. There people meet together and someone is in charge, someone counts the money, and then there are committee members who make the decisions, a chair, a treasurer, and a committee. It sounds a bit like the setup in a church, doesn't it? So what makes church stand out, be different from these other clubs? The most important thing is knowing God. The Apostle Paul tells us that his background was impeccable. His upbringing, nationality, family background, inheritance, orthodoxy, activity and morality could not be bettered. At first, when we read this passage, it sounds a bit like he's boasting. But in fact, it is the opposite that is true. Paul is saying that none of his credentials, credits, or successes have any worth when it comes to knowing God, when it comes to salvation. For it is only by God's grace that anyone can be saved. In our lives, we need to establish relationships with others to have a life full of meaning, love, and people who matter to us. There are all sorts of relationships. We usually establish relationships first within our own family, then friends, and then our professional life, our school life, among acquaintances, the people we meet when they serve us in the shops. Then there are romantic relationships. And lastly, the relationship we have with ourselves. If you took a look at your phone and thought about all the people in your contact list, you could tell me what category each of them fell into. Oh, that's my brother or my sister, or that's my friend, or oh, that was a girl I met years and years ago. But tell me this, how would you describe your relationship with God? Is it close? or distant, warm, or cold, loving and tender, or maybe you just find it a chore. Nothing else in this life, none of our achievements or gains come anywhere close to the wonder of knowing God. Our relationship with Jesus is more invaluable than any other relationship in our life. To know Christ should be our ultimate goal. Have I confused you by using both the name Jesus and the title Christ in the last two sentences and yet meant the same person? Jesus is the human name given to the Son of God when he became incarnate and was born to Mary. Christ is a title. It means Messiah or anointed one or chosen one. In the Old Testament, the word translated from the Hebrew is Messiah. And in the New Testament, the same word is translated from the Greek as Christ, Christos. But both mean the same thing. So how do we get to know him better? The first way is to study the life of Jesus in the Gospels, to see how Jesus lived and responded to people. Matthew 11 and 29 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Secondly, study all the New Testament references to Christ. 
A good starting point is Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, all the way through to chapter 2, verse 15. Part of that says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. And three, as you worship and pray, let the Holy Spirit remind you of Jesus' words. John 14 and 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And lastly, we are to take up Jesus' mission to preach the gospel and to learn from his sufferings. Matthew 28 and 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And where we were reading, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. To do these things, however, may mean that we must make major changes in our thinking and lifestyle. So the question becomes, are you willing to change to know Jesus better? When we commit our life to Jesus, we don't suddenly become perfect. It's a process. Gradually, over time, and as we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, we change. We lose interest in some of the things that we had thought so important and start doing other things we never thought we would. The person that we were, what the Bible calls the old man, is left behind and the new person we are becoming grows and matures. Things which seemed so important to me in the past no longer hold the same interest for me. Old friends have drifted away, not liking the new me, and God has placed other new friends in my life. Now, I'm also quite sure that we all feel that our lives are extremely busy, and we have very little time to fit in prayer or Bible reading. So are we prepared to rearrange, maybe even remove some activities, like the time spent playing Candy Crush Saga, in order to spend time getting to know God? And as we learn more about God and his heart, are we prepared to give up some of our plans, goals or desires? in order to put in place the godly principles we're learning. You know, having Christ in your life and being one with him more than compensates for anything we have to sacrifice. Paul points out that no amount of law-keeping, self-improvement, discipline or religious effort can make us right with God. Righteousness comes only from God, and we can only be made righteous by trusting in Jesus. In verses 12 to 14, Paul says that his goal was to know Christ, to be like Christ, and to become all that Christ had in mind for him. This goal took up all of Paul's energies. We too should not let anything take our eyes off our goal knowing Christ. The last few weeks we've been watching the Commonwealth Games and now the Europeans. We've heard young men and women share the stories of the single-minded determination that has resulted in gold, silver or bronze medals. We too are to display that single-mindedness of an athlete in training. We too must lay aside everything harmful and forsake anything that may distract us 
from being effective Christians. What's holding you back? Maybe it's that you don't feel like you're good enough. None of us are. Even Paul, with his seemingly perfect background, had things that he was ashamed of. He had zealously persecuted the early church. He blasphemed Christ. He looked on with glee and held the coats of the men who stoned Stephen, the first Christian martyr, to death. We have all done things of which we're ashamed. And we live every day in a state of tension between what we are and what we want to be. But don't dwell on your past, running old sins, old failures on that loop, that repeat. Grow in the knowledge of God by focusing on your relationship with him now. Accept that you are forgiven and push forward to a life of faith and obedience. Look forward to a fuller and more meaningful life because of your hope in Christ. The next thing we are told is that we are to work together in loving harmony. And I'm going to read from Philippians 4, verses 2 to 9. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Cynthia to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, Help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, Present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. In life, there are all sorts of divisive influences, issues, loyalties and conflicts. And when life is hard, it is so easy to turn on one another. But we are to agree with one another. Stop complaining and work together. As Christians, we are to be united against the mutual enemy, the devil. We are to keep before us the ideals of teamwork, consideration of others and unselfishness. When we are united in love, Christ's strength is most abundant. There is nothing we cannot achieve when we move together, united under God. Paul is coming to the end of his letter and is now calling for reconciliation, joyful faith and disciplined thinking. Paul doesn't tell us what had caused the disagreement between Eudia and Cynthia, but he begs them to follow the principles he has already laid out in chapter 2, verse 2, and agree, or be of the same mind. Paul is especially keen to see them reconciled, as these are women he knows well, and who have worked alongside him in the past. Paul also calls for the church to rejoice in faith, to replace anxiety with expectant, grateful prayer, to display attitudes of joy a deep contentment in the Lord that is based on trust in the sovereign living God 
and is always available to us, even in the most difficult of times. And further, Paul asks for reasonableness. In verse 5, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. In order for us to actively pursue, work towards what is best for everyone, and not just for ourselves, we need to be a reasonable person. I looked up reasonable in a dictionary. It means considerate, having sound judgment, to be fair and sensible, to be based on good sense, and to be able to reason logically. A fan once asked Leonard Bernstein, the famous orchestra conductor, what is the hardest instrument to play? Without hesitation, he answered second fiddle. The world is full of first violinists, but to get a second violinist or a second French horn or a second flute who plays with as much enthusiasm as the first, now that's a problem. But without a second violin or flautist or horn, there's no harmony. Because of our pride, we all want to be first. But if we want to live in harmony, we've got to be second fiddle sometimes. Romans 12 and 5 tells us we're to live in harmony with one another. So we, though we are many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Families are destroyed by a lack of harmony. Friendships are destroyed by a lack of harmony. Ministries are destroyed by a lack of harmony. And churches are destroyed by a lack of harmony. We need to be of the same mind toward one another or have the same attitude. 1 Peter 3 and 8 states, Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. What does it mean to be like-minded? Does that mean we have to agree about everything? Of course not. It's virtually impossible for two people to agree about everything. Or possibly even anything. We're all different and we see things differently. We have different backgrounds and experience different upbringings. We have different personalities and temperaments. How many of us here today tend to see things in black and white? It's either right or it's wrong. Nobody's owning up. Who sees grey? How many of us are mourning people? Definitely not me. How many are night owls? Even as men and women, we are entirely different. So no two people are exactly alike. God made us with our differences. And yet it is he who says, be like-minded. If being like-minded doesn't mean that we have to agree about everything, what does it mean? It means that we are to have the mind and heart attitude of Christ. Romans 15 verses 5 and 6 says, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. My last reading is Philippians 2. Verses 1 to 8. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. 
Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Amen. If we're going to be like-minded, whose mind are we going to be like? The answer is Jesus. That's how we learn to be like-minded. We are to develop the same heart attitude as Jesus. And Paul describes that attitude for us. Even though Jesus was God, he emptied himself and became obedient even to the point of death on a cross. That's why Paul wrote in verses 3 and 4, Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility count others more insignificant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. That's the mind of Jesus, the heart attitude of Jesus. Empty yourself, humble yourself, put others before yourself. Remember, Jesus is only asking us to do for others what he's already done for us. The attitude that I'm right and you're wrong is the source of most conflicts. Conflict is settled when we admit that Jesus is right. I'm not. So I have to constantly recalibrate to Jesus. 19 years ago, almost to the day, a young fellow in our church called Harry McGill bought Victor, my husband, and I a wedding present. It's a radio-controlled clock, and it's still going strong. Once a day, it pauses the hands whiz round and it resets itself to the exact time. In other words, it recalibrates itself. And that's what we are to do too, at least once a day. Stop, pause and reset. I need the mind of Christ, the heart attitude of Jesus that serves and sacrifices for others. When Jesus died on the cross, he was right. We were wrong, but he died to save us. We're to be sympathetic. In our modern world, sympathy has become an underrated heart attitude, but sympathy is good. It shows that you're paying attention to what the other person is going through and that you feel for them. Sometimes the best gift we can give someone is to sympathize with them, to share their feelings, weep with them or laugh with them. It's the gift of understanding. And sometimes it's all the help we need, just knowing that someone understands and cares. <coughs> Excuse me. Be humble. Have the same regard for others as we do for ourselves. We all enjoy being with people who are like us, our own kind. But there's a very real danger there too. There's a fine line between having friends who are like us and becoming a snob. Are there people who come to her, our church who aren't on the surface like us? That's good if there are, and if they're not, why not? And what do we do when we see them? Do we avoid them? Do we think, I hope I don't have to talk to them? Do they make us uncomfortable? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then it's time to humble yourself before God and ask him to help you to see every person as valuable and worthy of our time and attention. 
they're valuable to Jesus and therefore they should be valuable to us. We need to love one another. We need to have a high regard for one another. We need to overcome our fears and discomfort and form relationships with one another. So to be a vibrant, joy-filled church in today's world, we are to know God, work together in loving harmony, and my final thought today is that we are to take God's good news to the world. As Christians, each and every one of us have been directed by Jesus to take the good news of the gospel to the world. What's the importance of the unity that we've just been discussing? It's because the gospel is not to make us individuals worshipping God in isolation. Instead, we are to be united in service to promote the gospel. After all, Jesus told the disciples to go into all the world and take the gospel to everyone. Peter's letter makes it clear how much he values his salvation. Everything that has gone before the day he met Jesus on the road to Damascus counts for nothing. For him, it's as if his real life started that day, and he cannot wait until his race is won, and he claims the prize of seeing Jesus face to face in heaven eternally. That same joy and hope are ours too, all of us who know Jesus as Lord. Think about your family. Don't you want those who are not yet Christians to have the same security that you have? I know I do. None of us want those who we love to come to the end of their lives and go to hell because we fail to tell them about Jesus and his love for them. So let's start there. Reaching out to our intimate circle and then moving on into the wider community beyond. May God bless us all. Our final praise is your hand, O God, has guided. <laughs>
do please stay for tea or coffee after the service if you possibly can. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore. Amen.